Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Arnie Lukes here at the Crossroads, and I'd like to welcome my guests from around the world, around the country and around the world. Welcome, David Smith. Good morning, Arnie, and good morning, everyone. No worries. Pleased to have you, David. Robert Clink. Welcome, Robert. Good to see everybody here, Arnie. No worries. Always a pleasure to be in these forums. Ha, ha, ha. And Wallace Clink. Welcome, Wallace. Well, I'm basking in the sunshine in Western Canada right now, okay. and we uh, don't have much snow, just a, a bit, and uh, the temperatures are around the melting point. So it's really uh, quite a drastic change from what it was a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. I bet the um, I bet the Texans are pleased to be out of the cold right now. <laughs> okay, let's do a yeah. Let's do a lap of um, let's do a lap of the websites. Um, first one, this is our homepage, alor.org, and you'll see our, our videos are up, and also, of course, the podcasts are produced from the videos, and then the On Target is produced from the podcast and videos. It uh, goes to building it. Right, the um, the Australian. Now, I'm, um, I find this interesting because the um, there's an election on in Western Australia, and they're more or less um, already destroying the two-party system. They're, they're essentially undermining a national paper, undermining the Liberals in Western Australia. They're quite happy with the Labor government. And so the, um, the national paper has, is essentially saying that there's no chance that they will win. Um, I think it's a shambolic, shambolic Western, Western Australia lives. I think that's really important because it's going to lead us into today's subject. The second one, JobKeeper causes cognitive dissonance from the Australian Financial Review. I found this fascinating because um, this bloke here, um, uh, Harvey Norman, is uh, is big on he's big on uh, furniture and things like that. He sells it and he's made a lot of money out of it. Now he's is what he's saying is that he's not taking into account. He's not taking into account the job seeker payment which he has received as a company, and um, <laughs> and this bloke here is saying that this is just a load of crock. That the whole reporting process that they're using for this uh, company is a load of crock. Cognitive dissonance. He's using it, and I think that's important to consider. That um, it's not. It appears as if the reporting is not even to an accounting standard anymore. Um, this one, I think, is quite important on Epoch News. It's showing that the United Nations, the United Nations, is giving the names of dissidents to the Communist Party of China. Giving the names of dissidents to the Communist Party of China. So there's a direct link between the United Nations and the Communist Party of China. That's um, horrendous. And uh, Gateway is showing that the school students... Putting on a concert have got to be in these bubbles, and um, that is absurd. But that's what they're doing because of supposedly COVID. It really is. We're living in times where um, we're not thinking at all. We're not thinking straight. Um, we're not taking into account um, the real world. It's essentially this haze, this superficial world. I noted the other day there was there was a discussion on whether. Um, Transgender people should be able to compete in women's sports, and of course, if they're um, biologically they're something other, and then competing, there's a there's a distinct disadvantage because of the um, higher testosterone less levels within one person to another um, of different sex, and so you you've got a a clear advantage of where you're saying, well, if someone's got um, they've made their choice, but you're going to assess them based on drugs. And testosterone is a drug that's prohibited, and yet in this instance, it's uh, it's quite okay for someone to have elevated testosterone and compete in that sport. And of course, that's uh, what are we talking here? Are we are we completely insane? Or are we devoid of any rational thinking at all? Now there was a a book that I came across, and I'm going to um, actually cut back to the website just to navigate through <laughs> to the book. Um, I think it's critical in in our thinking. And that's the PDF library here. And we go across to Belloc and Chesterton, the party system. 
Now, I'm reading this book at the moment, and I'm finding it fascinating. It was written in 1911, and these two blokes, um, Chesterton and Belloc, Cecil Chesterton, not G.K., um, they were members of, of Parliament, and their writing about the goings-on, the actual machinations of the party system, um, they actually charted where the party systems came into power and how they were able to actually dominate the parliament to the point where it is ineffectual. The actual executives between both major parties, if you've got an opposition, or if there happens to be three or even four, the executives come together and discuss which way it's going to go and where the policies are going to go. And of course, those executives are controlled by big business, big finance, those big contributors to the parties who actually get the things that they want. So the other week I talked about the um, United States and their constitution and how it's all about um, controlling their parliament, their congress, for the benefit of big money. And Britain, it's no different. And I would put it to you that that book, written 1911 about Britain, is no different than Australia. It's as if it was written today, yesterday. It's so current. And no doubt, I'm sure, that it's um, it would be current even for um, Canada as well. Anyway, David Smith, I'm going to give you the floor, and I'd be interested in your thoughts. Well, thank you, Arnie. Uh, you've only got to look at our parliament today, and uh, it's, it's not a parliament where um, representatives go to represent the will of uh, their constituents. The, uh, they, they, they say what uh, they are allowed to say. And anybody who steps out of that, uh, you've only got to look at Craig Kelly for his mild comment. Um, there could be much more behind it, we realise. But uh, he's shouted down and hounded um, for what he said. Um, ask, ask Pauline Hanson. Um, I can't think of other names at the moment, but you're not allowed to uh, state truths in Parliament anymore. There's no debate. There's no um, uh, working over a subject to find out where, what, what's right and what's truth and what's for the good of the people. It's it's uh, a charade, um, and every time you watch Parliament, it, it becomes more farcical. Mm. Uh, I think that's my comment. No worries. Thank you for that, David. It's <clears throat> That's really important um, to actually lay that groundwork, that it is farcical. Now, the the book, The Party System, it showed, it showed me, it was actually the recording of where the major parties, even if they're in opposition... The major parties executive actually control both parties and they're in agreement and it really is marionettes for the camera. That's all it is, marionettes for the um, for the mainstream media and of course the mainstream media is complicit. So big money controls our parties and big money controls the media and so it really is a, a charade. The whole thing is a charade and I... I find that extraordinary that the, that uh, Chesterton and Belloc were actually stating this 110 years ago. But they recorded the change, the significant change in the performance of Parliament of where dissenting views were actually sufficient to bring a minister down or to bring a government down. And dissenting views changed drastically around 1860s in England. They changed drastically. And that, to me, is very, very important to recognise that that is the infancy, that's the actual um, establishment of the party system. Robert Clink, your thoughts, please. Well, I think uh, a lot of people are realising that we've been living in a fool's paradise, uh, playing this game of alternating parties. You know, you elect a party normally because you don't like what's been going on. You don't normally vote positively for a new party. You just get so tired of the fellows who've been in power that you want to get rid of them uh, one way or another. So they've got to go. Uh, but <clears throat> this alternation is the pattern in, in all democratic countries. But the, the thing is that 
in order for them to keep people distracted by this game, they have to maintain an illusion of choice. And that's why the parties ostensibly have different philosophies, they have different approaches to things. But once they get elected, you find that they're quite consistent and the underlying uh, program of government continues and the, the fundamentals are not really challenged. Uh, the people end up being suckered again. <laughs> they get a new bunch in there and four or eight years later, they're tossing them out because they find that they're not satisfactory. And you'd think that at some point people would uh, get tired of the game and say, I'm not playing anymore, but it seems to work and work and work. The, the memory of the public seems to be uh, terribly, terribly short. And they're always looking to this uh, party system to deliver them from what they consider to be unsatisfactory circumstances. And they incarnate this in some leader. Well, uh, this will never work because that is the ultimate centralization of power <clears throat> and organizations that are centralized are absolutely susceptible to infiltration and take over at any time. So we've seen over and over again how this operates. And uh, it's uh, funny now because it used to be that the opposition would be uh, uh, critical on, on, on some basis that a, a, a significant popular por portion of the population would support. But now the only opposition you seem to see in any parliament is from people who want to be more extreme in the direction of political correctness than the already crazily uh, politically correct government. So there is no more even pretend opposition. It's all oriented in the same direction. And no matter who you vote for, you're just gonna get more and more extreme policies that, that tend in the same way. Uh, we've had an experience of this in the social credit party. Uh, the social credit, uh, 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 people in Alberta elected a government in 1935. They had a struggle with Ottawa, the federal government, Alberta being a province, to try to take control of their own finances. And uh, in 1943, in March, the Premier, Eberhardt, made a speech in which he left no doubt that he was going to continue this battle and even intensify it as the end of the war came. Well, two weeks after he made that speech, he died. He was not an old man, he died. And the party was taken over by a fellow named Manning. Well, this fellow who was Eberhardt's chief lieutenant, you would have thought nobody could be more reliable in continuing the policy of the party than this man. Well, he'd sabotaged the whole thing. Eberhardt had set up study groups. He disbanded the study groups all the people who were uh, dedicated uh, Douglas social creditors, the ones who believed most uh, strongly in the monetary reforms of social credit were sidelined. And uh, uh, it was the end of the movement. This guy remained in power for a long time because he was a clever man and a good administrator, but it was the end of any attempt to give Alberta control over its financial affairs and to free it from the control of the, uh, the, the the banking system. So you can see this man who should have been the most reliable uh, replacement for Eberhardt, who was obviously a man of great integrity, was used as a tool to, to sabotage the movement. So it'll happen every time. They just get another person in there. The person might even be of good intentions, but there are ways of controlling people, you know. And the fact that his predecessor died suddenly might have given a <laughs> pretty good indication to Manning that uh, maybe he ought to modify the direction the party was taking. Mm. So this is this is politics. Yeah. Not a pretty picture. No, it's certainly not certainly not a pretty picture. It's actually quite intimidating. You think that um, a political leader can be uh, can be murdered, 
um, just in order to pursue a policy. But of course, that's desperate times. And uh, I mean, <laughs> people do. This is it. This is the pressure that they're under. Um, recently, with the elections in America, there was certainly a lot of talk about the Chief Justice and how he, ha he has been compromised. And then he was actively campaigning to suppress any dissent from the Supreme Court. Um, these things are, to me, these are really very, very important to consider that you won't actually get a clear run um, putting all your faith in one person. Your thoughts, please, Wallace. You can only put your faith in the truth. Now, the truth is not always that easy to come by, but it is it is an absolutely uh, incontrovertible truth. I mean, you can only prosper by following that which is the truth. And um, unfortunately, unless you take a, a different uh, interpretation, the, the struggle for power is very compromising to, to, to the truth because people will conveniently bend the truth in order to uh, fulfill their aspirations of power. And it's, um, it's, it's the power that people have over others at lower levels that tend to make the system so inflexible because people do not want to risk their security and their, um, well, their financial security in the first instance and other benefits to position and they go with power. So um, it seems to me I might I might be so bold as to suggest that perhaps the trend as that has occurred to corruption may be related to a breakdown in the morals or ethics of the average individual because there's a lot of cynicism about uh, certainly about religion and that sort of thing. And some people seem to think that it has no basis and can be ignored and even must be ignored. So it's, um, it's hard to tell how much um, this trend has been due to a, uh, it's, it's basically a lack of faith, a lack of faith that has developed and the cynicism that has come from that. We're told that if we do things right or we think right or we give proper homage to the deity, that things will go well and we find that things have not gone well. We've been drawn into horrible wars of destruction and violence against other peoples, other nations which have absolutely benefited no one. It's just uh, only the only people that's benefited is, is the big financial powers, the, the, uh, the banks that have financed these horrendous events. And that, of course, has strengthened those who are in favor of centralized power. The very people we would not we we should not be anxious to strengthen. And we've got a pyramid of power. Douglas, Douglas wrote a, an essay, The Pyramid of Power. And it shows how society has been corrupted by a top-down dominance that um, forces people's behavior often against their better moral judgment. But you know, unless people, as, as far as I'm concerned, the whole thing has been totally corrupted. Corrupted because we have all these things. There's no free lunch. Well, it seems to me that the whole nature of Christianity is, is something free from your life to the resources that you find yourself in possession of. Um, and today, the, um, with the enormous benefits that have developed from technology, the uh, science of efficiency, if you want, um, has provided the basis for an enormous 
inheritance that it's got nothing to do with necessarily being related to your current efforts. As a matter of fact, our current efforts are distorted, distorted and distorted because as I've said before, if you have a group of people who are in a primitive situation and they engage in some project to grow, you know, to grow some food or something like that, and they have an enormous success, and at the end of the period, they end up with a real abundance, they would normally divvy it up, share it, and enjoy the results of their joint efforts. But today, it doesn't work that way. We have to, we're forced to do something else before we can actually access the fruits of our previous efforts. And that seems to me to be logically dreadfully flawed. It doesn't make sense. You cannot have what you produce today until you earn the money by doing further work. And that obviously distorts the whole productive system. And it, it, it means that you're going to be producing things which you normally, in many cases, would not produce because you wouldn't find that it was something you wanted or that was really valuable. And so that push, pushes you into a mode of behavior which is, dis, which is clearly uh, divorced from reality. You're being forced to do things for a secondary purpose, not a primary purpose. And in that case, you're going to end up doing useless, irrelevant, and destructive things just so that you can eat what you produced last, last year or the last period of production. And because we all have to eat, we all need the basis of material security, we have no alternative. We're forced into this type of perverse behavior. And that has its effect of corrupting the whole general fiber or moral tone of society because it, it causes cynicism, maybe not always understood, but the very irrationality of it is bound to have its toll on people's thinking and their attitude toward what is right and what is wrong. Because they're forced to do what is wrong or what is irrelevant or what is destructive in order to have the benefits of, of a half normal life. Mm. And this is, you talk about cognitive dissonance. This has got to cause enormous confusion in the mind. Whether the mind is aware of it or not is another thing. But it, it uh, abstracts us from reality and, and really sabotages the whole quality of life. Mm. Thank you for that, Wally. That's, um, that's beautifully put. I was thinking of um, there are different, if you like, job descriptions um, that would, to me, became most apparent of, of, if you like, wasted energy, wasted resources. One of them mm. is the bureaucrat, is, the, is essentially the, um, yeah, the bureaucrat imposing their will or their interpretation of a myriad of regulations and uh, and decrees over over people in order to control them to to ensure compliance i mean what honest use and then you look at the say the manufacturing and exporting or if you like the issuing of armaments uh, to to another people in the form of bullets and bombs um i mean honestly in order to buy food, to buy what we've already produced, we've got to have things like that happening. And yet there is no, there is no imminent threat to the borders. There is no imminent threat. It's really, it's expansionist policies that are actually causing the escalation of the numbers in military. Expansionist. We need to dominate that country or dominate that country or get that natural resource from that country. And so we've got to ha have this whole contingency. Um, it's an imbalance. It really is. And of course, this one policy comes from both sides, comes from all sides of politics, comes from all sides. There's an agreement that will pursue this. And in this instance, this modern instance, we've got the um, COVID 
and we've got the vaccines. And of course there are options, there are many medical treatments apart from vaccines in order to stimulate your immune system, maintain it at a high level so that you can actually produce your own antibodies. These these diseases come and go and it's seasonal and you just process it and uh, get on with your life. And this is something that my wife and I choose to do every season. And we have our own methods of doing it and they are successful. They are successful. So it's, to me, choosing to do those things, but where we see leaders being injected with mRNA, which essentially is a genetically modified organism, which causes a change in your gene structure to market a product, and you don't know the long-term ramifications of it. These companies are given indemnity. You don't know the long-term repercussions of it. And all of these things are really, really important to understand this is you're being compelled to do something take something inject something into your body or if you like consume it through the water system you're being compelled to do it these are all really really important considerations your thoughts please um david smith oh you you've opened up a can of worms there with all this covid business the uh, the the virus is not the problem. We, we've been talking about the problem, and that is our parliaments do not represent us anymore, and we cannot um, utter a word of uh, dissent without being shouted down. And uh, um, as I've uh, pointed out in the last um, contact with you, the Australian Vaccination Network was absolutely slandered um, for their stand in going out with a bus and interviewing parents of children who have been damaged by these vaccines. And they were absolutely vilified and slandered for doing so. And here is another journalist, um, Jane Hansen, she put a documentary on Sky News this last week. And uh, it's, it was just a full frontal attack on Meryl Dory and the Australian Vaccination Network and the work that they're doing to highlight just what a child goes through and a parent goes through when they when they react to these experimental vaccines and and the all the childhood vaccines that have been going on for years um, it's diabolical what is happening and it, how it is being silenced any dissent to it um, but that's the story with everything and uh, you've spoken about the waste of war, just uh, Wallace and Arnie, a colleague sent through a um, story about the pushing overboard of every jeep that was um, built and sent to the war zone that was surplus at the end of the war. They were pushed overboard off, off the ships um, rather than being uh, to be brought back home because it would so depress the market for automobiles in America. Um, it's diabolical the power that corporations have uh, over government these days, but that's nothing new. Thomas Jefferson saw that. I can't remember the quote, but he saw it happening. Um, and feared the day when, because he could see the rise of that power, and that's what we're seeing today. Mm, yeah, thank you for that, David, and that's exactly right. The power over and above our government, and of course they're using the party machine, the party system, they're using it to um, to control our parliament so that they achieve their objectives. Um, to me, that's uh, that's that's quite important to, to recognise that and to understand it. Your thoughts, please, um, Robert Clink. 
Well, it's not only in politics that they're using that uh, control of uh, people through the illusion of choice, but I, I find it astonishing that in practically every supposedly democratic country now, that the justice system has become a, a an object of political uh, manipulation. You know, you mentioned, uh, I, I don't know if you mentioned him by name, but uh, Justice Roberts, the Supreme uh, Court Justice in the United States, and how when he was appointed, the supposed conservatives were so excited because they finally had their man in the position of Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And he has disappointed them on virtually every decision he's come down. So it, it was bizarre in the first place that they were all excited that they had a uh, an impartial appointee because they were hoping this guy would come down on their side of things. But surely the function of the court is to come down on the side of the law. But that's not the way it's seen anymore. And in Trump's day, there were two uh, uh, justices appointed to su the Supreme Court and the Trump faction was all excited. <laughs> and these people rejected the attempts to uh, uh, litigate the legitimacy of the vote in the in the recent presidential election. So again, it's just a, a thing where people get uh, excited about uh, the partisanship of appointees, and it's all fraudulent, and uh, it's not long before they're disappointed. We've got the same thing in Canada. We've got conservative justices and liberal justices and you know uh, it's a big deal who's going to be appointed the next time what government is going to be in power to make the appointment well the justice system shouldn't be political the justice system should be as impartial and as objective as it possibly can but the uh the partiality of politic politics has been injected into that field. And it's it's undermined the very concept of justice that we have now. Um, you know, uh, Wally mentioned the uh, destructive effect of some sayings that just fall off the tongue of so many people in any circumstances. He mentioned the one about there being no free lunch, which is usually coming off the tongues of people who benefit from lots of free lunches, they're on expense accounts, but they, you know, they're just uh, trying to maintain the illusion that uh, everything we get in life, we had better earn uh, by the sweat of our brow. They don't think that way for themselves, but they want to maintain that, uh, that control over other people. But uh, another saying that I think is perhaps even more destructive is the one I'm as good as the next man. I don't know who came up with that, but it excuses any kind of uh, misbehavior or corrupt practice because you can always find the next man who is no better than you <laughs> doing some kind of uh, uh, mischievous thing. But that is a total departure from what... Christ admonished, admonished us to be, and he said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's a tall order, I agree. <laughs> I, I doubt if any uh, person besides Christ could live up to it, but he set that as our standard of aspiration, not to just be as good as somebody we can find out in the public uh, who is... Uh, performing in a in a substandard way so uh, all these sayings i don't know who has in, in uh, inseminated them in, in in the population but they're they're so current and they're very very destructive of maintaining high standards of uh of behavior and uh, performance um yeah that's all i'll say on that no worries. Thank you for that, Robert. It's um, it really is important for us to consider <clears throat> that um, our personal integrity. It starts with us. 
Because if we can't, as an individual, if you can't set a high standard, if you can't set the bar high enough, then how can you expect it from your public servant or from your politician? How can you expect it from any? Honestly, honestly, how can you expect it from any? And this goes, this goes really deeply because if we consider the, the vote, if we consider the vote, and this is why it's most important, when you actually vote, you generally in an election campaign are offered bribes. <clears throat> and you can't say you're not because the bribes can be for the electorate or they can actually be to derive benefit for you. It might be that there might be more support for you, more taxpayer dollars for you. Either way, all of these things are bribes. And are you actually choosing what is best for the community, what is best for your nation, or are you actually just choosing what's best for you? And so what you're doing is you're, you're essentially accepting the bribe, accepting the bribe. And um, Jeffrey Dobbs wrote about this, essentially, the, the responsible vote. Douglas touched on it too, the responsible vote, that if you vote for something and you're voting for more taxpayer benefits, then you also should have an obligation that you're the taxpayer who goes out to give those benefits back to yourself rather than taking off someone else when when you shouldn't have that uh, right to do that. So to me, this is important, this integrity question. How can we expect our politicians, honestly? How can we expect better from the party system, from the government, from the parliament, from the public servant, from the policeman? How can we expect better from any of them if we don't actually set the standard, set the bar, first thing, ourselves? Your thoughts, please, Wallace Clean. Well, many aspects to the subject. In the first place, we are the recipients of an enormous cultural heritage. And that cultural heritage is something in the way of knowledge of process and so on, which has enabled us to advance in a marvelous way in some way some aspects of things that we have. And um, what you receive by inheritance is not something that you personally have earned. It's a gift. And life itself contains a gift of unearned increments of association which accumulate over time. That becomes our cultural heritage. And... um, Unfortunately, um, whenever benefits are paid from the government, it is assumed, and rightly, that it's going to be something that where wealth is taken from your neighbors and redistributed. The problem is that we don't properly monetize this enormous cultural heritage in a way that does not steal from anyone, but actually helps generate prosperity in the community because of the demand that it would create and the opportunities for genuine producers to contribute to the to the community. And but you see, it's given a pejorative sort of meaning. It's it's uh, you're stealing, and that bears with it the assumption that labor produces all wealth. Otherwise, there'd be no basis for the uh, to complain. But that again is demonstrably totally f- uh, false as an argument, and especially today because you can push a button and set in motion a whole productive process, a whole factory almost, without a human being touching it. Now, I don't think that when cars are spewing out of the end of the production line and there's hardly anybody working in the plant, that you can very easily, logically make the argument that labor is producing all those cars. It's ridiculous. And uh, simply not not tenable. And uh, then the question is, of course, as you're producing all this wealth and you're needing less and less labor, what are you going to do with the products of industry? Are you going to dump it in the in, in the uh, in the ocean because it would be immoral for people to have access to those things? Would you uh, introduce some kind of sabotage to the productive system in order to retain 
a larger labor uh, contribution to the production. It doesn't make sense. It's, it's, uh, it's perverse. It's uh, simply not intelligent. So, you know, we have to have an outlet, an outlet for our productive endeavors. If there's no outlook for them, because we're wed to the idea that nobody can have anything unless they work for it. It seems to me we're coming to a, an impasse, an a logical impasse that simply cannot hold. And that is the idea that labor produces all wealth. In other words, that government should encourage full employment. There's nothing innately good about full employment. It's the attitude you have toward life and toward your fellow man that is important. And if work is so great, well, just how much work does it take to make a person responsible and moral? There'd be no end to it, literally or logically, but endless, endless increasing work. Now, anyone who's concerned about the environment should set up and take strong note of this tendency to produce more and more and more, regardless of the quality of the production. It's, it's a quantitative approach to economics rather than a qualitative approach. And a quantitative approach which suppresses a better way of doing things is nothing more than sabotage. And what is it sabotaging? It's sabotaging your standard of living. It is sabotaging your opportunity for leisure and for cultured activities, for the pursuit of knowledge and making a drone of you. Literally, literally nothing more than a drone. So um, it simply doesn't make sense. We're here to live, not here to work. Some of us will do things in the way of activities because of our natural curiosity about the natural world. Absolutely, and that's good and that's healthy. Even Douglas said that anyone who wants to just sit around and do nothing has probably got a psychological problem because it's not a normal response to your marvelous position in, in life. Which, which presents the opportunity for so many amazing experiences and uh, both physical and intellectual. So we're being robbed of our life, basically. We're being robbed of the, um, of the nature of true life. You know, I have had a couple of amazing co uh, conversations with in this case, American technicians, computer technicians, they had never heard these things. And they say, mm -mm. wow. And the last one I talked to said he's going to go to your website for sure. You see, it's there. It's a truth that exists and has enormous appeal. And the only thing that can prevent it is it's, um, being sought and accepted is the fact that there's a deliberate effort made to suppress it on the part of the various, <clears throat> the various uh, divisions of the opinion-making agencies in society, which serve not, the, not humanity, but which serve financial powers those who want power over other men. Thank you for that, Wally. That's, um, that's particularly well put, this, this question of power. I'll just be, de be distracted. I just noticed that the um, stock exchange, the stock exchange has slumped 5% as it's opened this morning. And <clears throat> I'm thinking, what has actually changed? What has, what has changed since the uh, close of stock exchange yesterday? Someone's driving something, a, um, a hedge fund decides to do something, or a bank or a central bank decides to withdraw credit. What has actually changed? 
The natural world is still there. The uh, productive capacity, the machines are still ready to go. They're still ready to produce just as much without human labour. Um, we can wind it up, we can wind it down. I've worked in, in um, highly technological industries, in the oil and gas and you can you can set and not set and forget, but it's not far off in the control rooms. It's uh, it's just half a dozen people or whatever are controlling this vast machine um, that produces sufficient oil and gas or fuels for an entire state. Half a dozen people, and of course with um, with agriculture, it's like three or four percent of the population produces enough to feed the whole population. So you look at that and you're thinking. You can wind it up, you can wind it back. Why does our share market change so volatile? Why is it Why is it such a rapid change? What are the players behind all this doing? And of course, if the, if the share market collapsed as in 1929, if it did collapse, who would be doing it? Is it the natural world? Is there a sunspot that caused a blackout and, and darkened the whole skies that the sun didn't get through? You know, is there an electronic magnetic pulse that came through from the sun, that turned all the machines off? No, none of these things. The stock exchange, the financial system, is a man-made system. And it actually changes, it varies simply by influences on it, by man-controlled influences. Central banks want to do something, they do it. Now, when we talk about a political party, when we talk about government, when we talk about representative government, what we're highlighting today is that 110 years ago, these two former politicians resigned in disgust at what was going on in their parliament. The manipulation of the both major parties, the opposition and the principal party in government, the manipulation was done through the executive of both groups. They were one and the same. And they decided, as in Western Australia at the moment, the opposition, the liberal opposition, have decided decided they're going to fall on their sword. They're not even actually going to challenge the existing government because it's their turn in opposition. And of course, as shadow ministers, shadow cabinet, they will receive virtually the same money as the, as the main cabinet, the real government, supposedly. They'll receive the same money. So sitting on their hands, doing nothing, they're still getting a jolly. And the people of Australia are not getting representation. We need to really look at this. I will make sure that link for that book is on this video, is, is within all of these things, so you can look at the party system. Why is it so, so important? Robert Clink, your thoughts and uh, closing comments, please. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I was involved with party activity for a while back in the 1970s, and I can tell you that... Uh, all these supposed political antagonists get along very amicably behind the behind the scenes and they attend the same social functions and in some cases they're even good friends with alleged uh, political foes so there is just as i think uh, david said the charade of uh uh, uh, an opposition, but in reality, it's 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 just not there. It's a it's a it's a fiction, an illusion, very useful to people who want to maintain a system of control, which is really one party in the guise of two or three. Uh, Wally was commenting about how he got such a wonderful reaction from these young uh, IT technicians. And, you know, it's the power of an idea. You present a new idea to somebody and it's as though, if they're bright, it's as though the light goes on. And once you get an idea inside you, it's hard to extinguish. Well, Major Douglas, back in the latter days of the First World War, discovered something that became a novel idea, and it had tremendous implications, fundamental implications for all of society. And uh, those who uh, came to understand the discovery he had made had it transform their lives. It it uh, gave them gave them a purpose in life that they had never previously had. 
This is the power of an idea. And it's also why the social credit idea was, uh, once it looked as if it was spreading, it was suppressed. The uh, press was told not to mention it, or if they did mention it, to misrepresent uh, the ideas that it embodied. And uh, so uh, the, the, the power of an idea was illustrated by the, the reaction of these young people to the discussion they had with Wally. It's a, a, a wonderful thing. Um, you know, <clears throat> I was thinking the other day, if we went back to the origins of finance, and if we were developing a system of money for society, on what principles would we establish it? And it seems to me that if you were starting out, you would ask basic questions like, uh, how much money should we be creating? And how should we be injecting this money into the, uh, into the society? How should we be distributing it? But these fundamental questions just aren't asked anymore because we've got an existing system. It works in the way it has for a long time. And uh, the, the, the most fundamental uh, issues are simply not addressed. Well, uh, C.H. Douglas did address them and he came up with some really revelatory concepts and uh, they truly are essential if we're going to get out of the morass that we're in now. Things are falling apart very quickly. Douglas said everything eventually would fall apart. He said the, the system we have now could not be sustained. And I think that the financial power actually recognizes this. And that's why they put this big drive on to uh, turn everything in society upside down totally confuse everybody with cognitive dissonance because they they know the system they're operating will eventually has to eventually be exposed as as fraudulent and inoperable so if we're going to if we're going to save ourselves from the position we're in now we'd better examine some fundamental questions about uh, about finance such as uh the uh, amount of money that is required, the uh, way in which this money is distributed to uh, liberate human initiative, and uh, the uh, necessity of supporting the consumer function in society, which is totally neglected. So uh, these are issues that are critical and the answers to them were developed a century ago and worked upon and refined to a degree, but uh, they were sitting there for people to, uh, to discover and uh, they're, still, they're still out there if people want to find a way out of the impasse we're in now. Well put, well put, Robert Clink. Um, I'm thinking of the 1918 when Douglas... Um, issued economic democracy to the public for him to, for them to, for the public to learn about what he had actually seen. Now that is really not more than I think 25 years since the giant turbines were placed into Niagara Falls, and those turbines originally, and uh, I think it was Westinghouse, were actually DC direct current generators, direct current generators, but it was Nikolai Tesla. Who, who developed the polyphase, the rotating magnetic field, where it changed from DC to AC. And of course, with that, then you, instead of having a, a spaghetti of wires going across the city, you only had three phases, three wires, plus the earth coming across. And so you could distribute power and you could decentralize electrical energy. Fascinating discovery that was only really 25 years before Douglas showed the um, flaw in the financial system and, of course, how to actually bridge that gap, the A plus B theorem. So it really was 
revelatory. This, this time, this release of energy, this release of technology, and of course, this release of understanding, a release of understanding. And so it really is so, so important. These things won't, they won't come to you overnight. It takes effort, it takes study, it takes scholarship. But that's what the meaning of the word leisure is about. Your thoughts and closing comments, please, um, Wallace Clank. Well, Annie, if I understand the situation correctly, both you and Bob are basically pointing out that we live in a natural world with the resources of energy and materials and uh, creativity that that embodies. And we also live in a separate um, world of finance. And the assumption is that that world of finance simply reflects what is going on in the physical world or what potentially could go on. And that is a really rash assumption to make because the financial system is more of an abstract. It's got no substance. It's a measurement system of measurement. And we have to uh, be assured that the type of measurement it's giving us is actually faithful to the reality of the situation. And Douglas pointed out where the financial system is a great violation of the real world in that it suppresses activities and distorts, and it distorts our activities. So we have to be sure that we actually do have a correct financial system or measuring system to represent what we what we can and what we choose to do in terms of production and consumption. And uh, unfortunately, there was a monopoly of credit that has developed, which is functions to direct the physical economy. And that monopoly of credit maintains basically a shortage of purchasing power. In other words, it has the ability to, to suppress human activity and um, both the production and the consumption side and increasingly on the consumption side. And that transfers political and administrative power to those who control the issue and cancellation or withdrawal of money. In other words, those who create and destroy credit. And that is, it's not only that there is a problem. The problem is becoming greater all the time because as you displace labor, you rob the community of the ability to buy what is being produced to that extent. And as Bob said, he said, looks as though the financial powers realize that as Douglas predicted, they've come more or less to the end of the rope because <clears throat> up until more recently, labor has maintained an important role in, uh, in the economy and in production. And it's rapidly, and it could be much more rapidly displaced because we have an enormous tendency to want to create work rather than to just let things happen at a natural rate. We insist that people have income and they have to have income through their work, basically. So unless there's a secondary method of ensuring that they have incomes by which to consume, uh, we're at an impasse. So that's why they are now doing these, um, they're actually trying to destroy the private sector of the economy and transfer power to the larger economic units, corporations, all operating under the umbrella of the financial powers, the banking system. So they're now drawing on the public credit and paying people to try and compensate for their lack of purchasing power, uh, whether it be individuals or whether it be uh, businesses. But it's only a stopgap stop measure, and it 
it's not going to solve the problem because the money is being created as debt, as it always has been. And that means that the community, at some point or another, theoretically at least, will be expected to repay that debt that has been created in order to give temporary relief. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's moonshine. It's, it's a complete, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a delusion. And it's not a proper solution to the problem at all. Douglas had an approach was, which was realistic in terms of the uh, issue of money to stimulate creative initiative and to ensure that enough money is created at the end process, at the consumption end, to make sure that people can benefit from it and keep rewarding those who do provide the good things in life that we can produce and have been able to the extension of, of, of debt until recently. So um, we've got to get back to reality because you cannot live in a, in a delusionary world of unreality. If you do, you're going to do unreal things and you're going to have very, very serious consequences, possibly fatal, fatal consequences. And um, we're going to have to really come out with, with a, a more realistic policy. And we're going to have, but basically we're going to have to change our attitude toward life, our attitude toward work. Recognize that work is just a means to an end. It is not a means in itself. It's not an end in itself. It's just a means to an end. And if you don't need so much work in order to achieve your end, what on earth is the sense of creating more work? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. That's right. Exactly right. Well put, Wally. Well put. An excellent summary of, um, of the objectives, of, of the considerations that we need to actually take into account. Um, in the situation we're, we're seeing ourselves in. Now the book, sure. I'll show it here, I'll just bring it up. Let's have a look, bring it up there. The Party System, Hilaire Belloc and Cecil Chesterton. It is on our website and I'm just going to, um, I'll just clear that cut across to it. Uh, just go across to our website and show you where. Under the PDF Library, if you go to the PDF Library under the right and then under here you'll see Belloc and Chesterton, the party system, and there it is there in PDF form. Uh, fortunate too, I think it was one of the universities who had a PDF copy and I had no trouble locating it this morning using a search engine other than the main search engine, um, but I had no trouble finding it, and um, and there it is, um, yeah, uh, available for everyone to consider their thoughts that uh, if we're going to work our way out of this, we've got to acknowledge, first of all, that we don't, currently have any control whatsoever of our parliaments. We don't have control of our politicians, none of them. And on that basis, then, we have to rethink the narrative. How are we going to actually even begin to uh, regain control of our politicians so that we can actually drive policy? Now, this book by Chesterton and Belloc will give you a, a pretty good heads up. It's 110 years old, but it's still as if it was written yesterday. It gives you a heads up as to the machinations of the party system, the government and the opposition, and also the other major players, the other parties that are around them, of how they control the entire narrative. And the, and the real considerations of the community are never taken into account. Only the considerations of vested interests. Thank you so much, Robert and Wally Clink, for today. It's been another interesting and challenging uh, Crossroads Forum. Thank you, Thank you, Ronnie. Okay, cheers, ladies.